your friends and family in the Lord. May the rich grace, mercy, and peace of our Savior Jesus Christ dwell within you now and always. May he fill your heart and your life with his blessings. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, you are our gracious God. You have shown us love beyond compare. Help us each day to be those who reflect your love, whose lives might be filled with your love. Lord, may you be the center of our hearts, and may we stop being so self-centered, selfish, and self-important, but instead focus on you and you alone, that all may come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior, that we may embody your grace with all we meet, to whom all we meet. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Featured in the March 6, 1943 edition of the Saturday Evening Post was a picture, a painting by Norman Rockwell. Now this painting, and I'm sure it may be familiar to some of you, it's a beautiful painting, and it's called Freedom from Want. Is anybody familiar with that painting? It was one in a series of four paintings that were painted uh, referring to the freedoms inspired by Franklin Delano Roosevelt's 1941 State of the Union Address. Rockwell wanted to put the four freedoms that he had spoken about in the address into picture so that people would be able to see them. In this particular picture, in this particular painting, freedom from want, he pictures, well, a family. Now much of the painting is white. The tablecloth is white. The room is white. But the people are full of color. And it's as if you're peering in on this family as they're sitting down to Thanksgiving dinner. You, you look, look around, around the, the table, table and you can only see obscured pieces of their faces. Their faces. But, but as you can, can see their faces, faces you can see uh, all generations represented. represented. You can, you can see, see a young girl with a mischievous little smile on her face, ready to do something she shouldn't. You can see the grandma with the white hair sitting at the center of the table, chuckling at a joke that she must have just heard. At the end of the table, you have grandpa and grandma, the matriarch and the patriarch. Grandma holds the giant bird, getting ready to set it down. Grandpa, Grandpa, he's arranging the table just so she can put it there. It's a picture of a beautiful family. It's a picture that maybe sometimes I think is, well, too pretty, too beautiful. There was a parody that I saw just last year done on this very painting of Rockwell, The Freedom From One. And they kind of showed the lead up to what the painting would have looked like before everyone sat down. They had multiple generations represented. They had different ethnicities represented, which is something that not in Rockwell's painting. But leading up to it, they had the couple who had been fighting for 30 years over the same thing, fighting about the same thing. You had the children not listening to the parents. You had the baby screaming and crying. You had grandpa and grandma not really ready to walk out of the kitchen. In fact, so much so that they dropped the turkey on the way to the table, had to pick it up quickly before anybody saw it. Does that sound a little more like a normal family? Maybe, Maybe so, huh? I think, I think a lot, lot of us would love that, that family that Rockwell painted. painted. That, that beautiful, beautiful family where things just seem to be going smoothly, where the, the smiles, the joy are not only in our mouths, but in our eyes, the, the happiness as we sit around the table together. But is that a description of your family? What about your family? Does your family sit down to dinner together? Or maybe it's been a while since you've been able to sit, to sit down together because of that argument that you had last Christmas. Maybe it's been a while since you've been able to sit down together as a family because, well, Grandpa Joe was always the one who brought you together, and now that he's passed away, you guys don't sit down as a family anymore. Maybe your family, it's hard enough to get them in the same room together because of fighting, bickering, backbiting, meanness and nastiness. It seems like the painting that Rockwell painted is just too perfect, too, too beautiful for us to even imagine. The freedom from want, but one, many of us want and long for families who would love each other, who would find joy in one another. But that's not how it is in this world, is it? We're in a world full of sinners who sin, a world full of families who, if they're not broken, they're certainly fractured. And yet, Paul uses this image. Paul uses the image of the family to describe the church. He, listen to Ephesians chapter 2 here. For through Christ Jesus, 
We both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Paul uses here in Ephesians that image of the family, but throughout his epistles, he uses an image of family to describe our relationship as brothers and sisters in Christ, the way that we are to live together. And the way he describes it, he wasn't picturing a broken family. He was picturing a family who would live together, who would love together, who would care together, who would share together. Paul was also a realist. But in case that image of the family wasn't strong enough, those bonds. In our epistle for this morning, he takes it one step for further, doesn't he? And he says that we are like the body of Christ. Not just a family, but we are the body of Christ. Whereas in one body, we have many members. And the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ. And individually, members of one another. We're all members of the same body. We are meant to live together, to breathe together, to move together, to go out into the world together. But it almost seems like Paul's words are a bit idealistic as well, don't they? Because all of us, we're members of the church, aren't we? We know that we are sinners, and we certainly recognize all the sinners around us. It's hard for us not to. How many of you have thought judgments, if not today, judged others who were in the church in the past? How many of you have desired that church be exactly what you want it to be? And when it wasn't that way, you got on the phone right away to complain about it to somebody else. How many of us have been hurt by other members of the church? By people who call themselves Christians and profess to be Christians, and yet we find ourselves with the deepest wounds from those people. It seems like Paul's image is so, so beautiful and yet so grandiose, so idealistic. It seems like Paul's perfect image for the church, the body of Christ, it's, well, it's fractured and broken. And yet, Paul hasn't given up hope on the church. Paul hasn't given up hope on the people of God. God has not given up hope for us, as broken as we are as fractured as we may be as the body of Christ. Think again about who Paul was writing to. Romans chapter 12. We've had 11 chapters to look at, and all throughout these 11 chapters, Paul has been trying to remind the people that you are the people of God, not because of your status as a Jew or a Gentile, not because of something you've done, but because of God's grace. Because of God's grace, you have been welcomed into the family of God. And that's, and that's the same, same message, message that, that he keeps reminding us of, that, that he keeps having to hammer home, having to remind us of, is that it is by God's grace that we are brought into the family. It is by God's grace, not because one of us has a better ability or one of us is a greater Christian. He didn't look at the Roman church and say, here we have the specimen of perfection. Instead, he looked at them as he looks at us. God, our Father, sees us and he sees us as those in need of a head that is perfect. Those in need of a body willing to take a sacrifice. Those in need of Jesus Christ as their Savior. Because that is who we are as the body of Christ. Christ came and he took his body and he allowed it to be beaten and scourged. He allowed it to be torn and broken. He allowed it to be sacrificed for us. So that we as the body of Christ would know his healing love and his healing grace, his mercy, his forgiveness for our sins. So that we would know that even as broken of a body as we are, as judgmental as we can be, as imperfect as we can be, that we still have a God who is the head of the church, who loves us and cares for us so much so that he is willing to die for us, that he has shown us this undeserved mercy that we call grace. Paul's words may sound idealistic, but they are words of hope and words of encouragement for us today. Reminders that the church has never been perfect because as long as we are on this earth, we are sinful people. We are people who turn back on our own selfish desires, our own selfish wants, and we put ourselves before others. But God, through Paul, envisions a greater day, a day when we will be the body of Christ in heaven with him, 
free from our sin, free from our suffering. Now Paul, though, he continues to encourage us here on this earth. He doesn't let us off so easy as we can say, well, one day we'll be all right. But he encourages us to live as the people of God now, to be different in this world. In fact, he starts off with something that's very important, to put aside our pride and to humble ourselves before the Lord. Listen to verse 3 here from chapter 12. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Paul reminds us to put on that humility, to stop allowing pride to live and reign in our lives, to stop allowing our self-centered self-desires, self-centric opinions rule our decisions, but instead allow Christ to. And the only way we can do that is if we first humble ourselves and come before his cross. When we think of the cross, it is a glorious image, but it is a humbling image. Because the cross does remind us that there was nothing we could do. We were dead in our trespasses, not alive, not breathing. Dr. Dale Meyer at the seminary, to his sermon classes, tells us in way of illustration, and at least he did this with ours, but I think it's with all the classes. He has a student get up on the table and he in front of the class and lay down. And they're to play dead. They're not to move. They're not to respond. And so he starts by asking questions. And as future pastors, you know, right away we're ready to answer. So he says, no answering. So then he gets ready, and not that he'd ever hit one of us, but it's, of course, if you're the first day of the class, and he springs down a book, and just before, what do you think most of those seminarians do? It's hard for us to imagine what it would be like to be dead. But that's exactly what we were. We could do nothing. We could respond in no way. And yet Christ made us alive. Christ gave us life. Not life to be spent on ourselves. Not life to be to take care of our greatness and our riches. But Christ has given us life to share his love with others. Christ has given us life to share his compassion with others. To share his comfort and his hope with others. We're not merely meant to coexist as Christians here on this earth. On Sunday morning, maybe we say hi to one another. Maybe we make it over to fellowship. Maybe we don't. No. We're meant to care for each other day in and day out as the people of God. And when he expands upon this idea of the body of Christ, I love how he does it because he does in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about how we are meant to live as the body of Christ and why it's so important. He says that when one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. When one part of the body is honored, the whole body rejoices. Why do you think we have a prayer chain? A list of names in our bulletin that we pray for each week. Why do you think that we go to visit people in the hospital, bring food to those in need, call people who we haven't seen in a while? We do so because when one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. On the other side, why do you think we rejoice with the young couple who gets married before our altar here? A husband and wife who are celebrating 58 years together. Why do you think we rejoice when, when a, a baby is born and brought to the waters of holy baptism or our matriarch celebrates her 97th birthday? Because when one part of the body rejoices, the whole body rejoices. It's not a Jesus and me. It's Jesus and us. It's life together as Christians walking together. It's not merely a, a, an idea, a grandiose idea, an idealized thought in our head. But this is what, how God intends us to live. This is what Paul is encouraging this Roman church to do. To live as the people of God. Not to merely talk about it, but to live out their faith. To care for one another. To love one another as Christ has first loved them. And then he goes a little step further. And he gives them practical ways to do it. Because he recognizes not all of us have the same gifts and abilities. Not all of us are going to know what to say when, when we call up someone who is sick or suffering. But God has given us different gifts that we might minister to others in different ways. Listen again in Romans 12. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. 
if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in his generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. And when you think about that list that Paul gives us, you know that it's not the full list of all the gifts and abilities God gives us. Because he has blessed each of you uniquely and wonderfully with different gifts and abilities. Different ways that you might share and encourage others. Different ways that you might show the love of Jesus to others. And Paul doesn't intend, nor does God intend for any one of us to keep this only in the church. Yes, it's good to take care of the family. It's good to take care of the body. But we're also meant to care for those outside of the body. We're also meant to care for those who are, have not yet been welcomed into the body of Christ. Those who are in the world around us. In our families, in our communities, even to the ends of the earth. We're encouraged to share that gospel message. And I know some of you have said before, well, what if we don't know what to say? Or what if we can't speak about our faith? Some of you are work in schools or work in offices where you can't share your faith openly. Well, there's no rule against living your faith. There's no rule against living out your faith in Christ Jesus. Living out, uh, living your faith as a person of God. Living a life that is different than the rest of the world. You don't have to talk about your faith to show someone that you love them. You don't have to talk about your faith to show someone that you care for them. You don't have to use words to show the person who is out in the street that you love them. You can pray for your enemies. You can share your love. In fact, St. Francis of Assisi, as you've heard, many of, many of you heard, have heard me quote before, he says, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. Now, I think Assisi, you know, he was almost right on, but I, th but I think the point that he was making was the fact that in our faith life, when we walk as the children of God in the world, as we live out our faith in the world, as our lives look different, as we care for people in ways that the secular world does not, this will open up doors for us to share our faith, to preach and proclaim the good news, where people will ask us, what is different about you? And it opens a door for you to share with them, Jesus loves me, and he loves you too. It opens a door for you to share with people that my Jesus, my Lord, the Lord of all creation, he died on a cross for your sins, for mine. It's amazing how living our lives just a little differently in the world, living our lives as the body of Christ just a little differently, the impact that will have on a world that is lost and dying, a world that is without hope, without comfort. Because we as the people of God bring that hope. We bring that comfort, and we bring that promise that although we live in an imperfect world today, although we're part of an imperfect, broken, and sometimes anguished body of anguish, we have a promise that one day we'll all be seated around the same table with the Lord. At the end of the table, our Lord will look down the table and say, welcome home to the marriage feast, which has no end. This is our hope. This is the promise. May the Lord bless you as you share this hope and promise. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are part of your household, your family of faith. We thank you that we are part of your body, that you have made Christ our head. Help us each day to seek you and to seek your ways. Help us each day to love as you have first loved us. Help us each day to share your good news with all those around us. Forgive us for those times when we are self-centered and self-important. When we're egocentric, inconsiderate of others, judgmental of others. Forgive us for those times. and Let us in instead share your love and share your faith. Share the promise that you have planted in our hearts. May your Holy Spirit move among us that we may be encouraged no matter where we are, whether we are in the body of Christ, in the church, or whether we are out in the world, to share the good news of the gospel, to share your promise of salvation, so that all may know 
what you say, that you are Lord of all. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.